So um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jana Pushkash. I'm a researcher in UNIDIR's uh, Security and Technology Program. And I'm really pleased to welcome you to part three of this UNIDIR webinar series on brain-computer interfaces. So this third and final webinar in this series will unpack uh, key legal and ethical challenges related to the use of interfaces in the military context and in armed conflict. This promises to be a fascinating and timely discussion, building on the introduction to the technology we had in the previous two parts. Brain-computer interfaces truly exemplify the dual-use nature of neuroscience applications and neurotechnologies. In part one in this series, we surveyed a range of applications of uh, BCIs, and we looked at the technology's current capabilities, including in the medical domain, as well as some uses for cognitive enhancement. In part two, we continue to look more closely at military applications, including at specific uses in safety critical contexts or for targeting. But we also looked into the larger picture, meaning at how various states are developing the technology and aiming to gain a competitive advantage. Today, we will explore legal and ethical aspects related to the use of uh, brain computer interfaces in the military context. I will just mention here some of the questions we will tackle. For example, what challenges does the use of interfaces pose for the applicability of international law and particularly IHL? Or what might a legal review for a BCI entail? Or what kind of ethical implications will the use of interfaces have in a military context? So of course I will, um, let our distinguished speakers provide answers to these questions. And now please allow me to introduce them. Uh, and I will do so in the order of their interventions today. So we are joined first by Dr. Heather Harrison uh, Denise, uh, who's a senior lecturer in international law at the Swedish uh, Defense University. Today, Heather will provide an overview of key IHL issues related to the use of brain computer interfaces in the context of warfare. Second, we have Dr. Uh, Ryan Livoya, who's professor and deputy dean at the University of Queensland Law School. His presentation today will cover some key aspects related to legal reviews of interfaces, as well as considerations related to human rights law and the rights of military personnel. And I should just say here that um, both Heather and Ryan wrote some of the pioneering legal analysis in this field, so we are really lucky to have them with us today. And thirdly, we have uh, Dr. Marcelo Yenka, who's a professor of ethics of AI and neuroscience at the uh, Technical University of Munich and group leader of Intelligent Systems Ethics Group, College of Humanities at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. Today, uh, Marcelo will introduce us to some of the most significant as ethical aspects of military uses of PCI technology. So now, without uh, further ado, I will just hand it over to Heather, who will, uh, who will share her uh, presentation with us. And we really look forward to, to your remarks today. Heather, you have the floor. Thank you. Can you see my slides OK? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So, uh, so as Ayana said, um, my job here today is to give you a brief overview of um, of the law of armed conflict and how that works with brain computer in inter interfaces. Um, but I just want to thank very much the um, Unidir and and the owner, particularly for for inviting me to speak. It's always always exciting to come and talk, um, particularly as part of this fascinating um, webinar series that you've had with the different aspects going through. So, thank you very much for that. Um, so, as I say, my my job here is to um, is to discuss the um, the sort of general overview of IHL and how it's going to work um, when we talk about brain computer interfaces. So, if I start just by refreshing our memories on what brain machine um, brain computer interfaces are, they're an attempt to connect the brain directly to a machine or a computer system without the need for manual input, either through a keyboard or a joystick, either through electrodes implanted into the brain or resting on the head. And as we've seen um, as part of this series already, the idea has been used in a couple of ways. And we've seen examples and demonstrations of, of both of those um, in the past two webinars in the series. So one, one way is to actively control a device of some kind, whether it be, um, whether it be a drone, flying a drone with your mind, there are a couple of projects working on that, um, or whether it be uh, to use the brain's power to sort of more passively sift information, because it turns out that the human brain is very, very good at seeing anomaly, anomalies in large amounts of data. Um, and an example of that um, use in, in the military sphere would be the cognitive threat warning systems that we're seeing being developed. 
So those are those are just a couple of ways in which we're seeing it uh, seeing it being used. But if we start with some some IHL fundamentals, so international humanitarian law IHL or the law of armed conflict, I'm going to use those two terms synonymously, is a body of law that applies, like it says on the tin, during armed conflicts. Um, so that's sort of the specialist body of law that that governs the conduct of hostilities during an armed conflict. And as I say, primarily, this body of law applies during armed conflicts. But there are some obligations that apply in advance. Um, for example, not situating military objectives in the middle of civilian infrastructure or objects, or ensuring that the weapon systems that you use in an armed conflict are capable of complying with the law. So these things are, are um, obligations that, are, that apply um, before an armed conflict take place and require you to take action before it takes place, which is why it's important to think about these things now while the systems are under development. The second issue that I, uh, that I want to flag up is that at the current state of technology, as I am aware of it, and I would point out that I have no security clearance with any of the countries with which I am affiliated, so I'm completely free agent to talk about what I know. Um, none of the technologies that, that are being investigated um, or that have been discussed in the previous webinar, webinars are enough to transform an individual from a person into an object. Um, so that's important because the law of armed conflict separates out those two things. Um, military objectives and civilian objects on the one hand, and combatants and civilians on the other. So it makes a distinction between people and things. Um, and that's and that's important because in general, the law also allows a far greater level of violence to be employed against materiel than it does against personnel. And in fact, it allows you to capture and use material for your purposes on the battlefield, whereas as it's a war crime to force a prisoner of war or another protected person to fight for your side. So it's important to, to um, sort of get out of our head the sort of science fiction trope that we have, of, oh, she's not a person, she's a machine, she's a weapon, um, and say, no, people are still people, even if they're cyborgs. Um, so, so that's an important thing. Um, and the, the reason that I mention it is, is because there has been some discussion um, about human enhancement technologies turning soldiers into weapons or, or at the very least into cyborgs. That's not to say that a particular enhancement might not be considered to be a weapon, but, um, but not the individual per se, not the individual itself. And obviously, that's going to be incredibly dependent on the technology itself. I'm not going to talk too much about that here, as I know that Ryan's going to be um, discussing weapons reviews um, and how they might fall into our, our discussion about what things are weapons, what things are, are means of warfare, and what things are methods of warfare. Um, but it's an important point, because it might also come into play when you want to assess, for example, what, what constitutes superfluous injury and unnecessary suffering, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, if what you want to do is, is overload an implanted neural chip in such a way that it's going to cause permanent brain damage, for example. The third point um, is that although some principles might be directly implicated by certain technologies, for perhaps most of the technology principle combinations, the content of the actual legal principle itself isn't affected by the technology primarily because what we're talking about here is technology that we're applying to our own forces rather than um, rather than against enemy forces. So we're talking about boosting our own soldiers' capacity rather than directly against, being used directly against enemy forces. But what it does have is an impact on the ability of the state to comply with the rules of armed conflict and the likelihood that their personnel will comply with the laws of armed conflict. So to give just one example of that, um, today there are many modern armed forces dealing with massive amounts more raw data um, than at any time in information uh, in information history. Um, so they've got headsets and video feeds and instant messaging and radio transmissions, and they're all adding to this cacophony of data that's going on. In fact, one estimate has put uh, has put the increase in data flow across the U.S. armed forces at 1,600% since 
Um, so on the one hand, we have this incredible access to data, which is helping us by permitting more accurate targeting and in limiting collateral damage because we know what's where. But it can also, on the flip side, result in soldiers from suffering information overload. And that can lead to tragic mistakes. So there are several different research projects. We heard about a couple of them in previous webinars, looking at different methods into increasing the brain's ability to multitask in order to be able to utilize the increased amounts of data without being overwhelmed by it. Um, and, and the methods the methods range, BCIs is just one of them. Um, monitor, the BCI that monitors sort of brain activity in order to identify threats before they're sort of consciously recognized um, as sort of the one that relates primarily to BCI technology. So if they're successful, then the requirement to take feasible precautions in attack to ensure that any target struck are legitimate military objectives will sort of necessarily be revised to take into account what's feasible when using new technologies. Um, so, so I want to um, want to sort of take a look at these principles that I've been talking about in a bit more detail, one by one, and just sort of think about how BCI technology might uh, might impact them. So, if we start with what's been phrased as sort of one of the cardinal principles of IHL, the the International Court of Justice has called it an intransgressible principle, uh, and that's the principle of distinction. So parties to an armed conflict shall at all times distinguish between the civilian population and combatants and between civilian objects and military objectives and shall direct their operations only against military objectives. So this is sort of the basic principle of, of distinction set out here. You'll note that not only is there the separation into civilian and military, but also the separation into people and objects that I was talking about earlier. So, um, so where BCIs come into here, uh, come into play, is that um, that we've seen the ability to assess threats using BCIs, sort of speeding up the ability to do that. We've made great leaps forward when it comes to speed, but when it comes to the principle of distinction, what we really need to be looking at is accuracy. Accuracy is the key when it comes to this. So, um, so some studies have looked at target recognition BCIs um, combined with deep brain stimulation and seen that that's increased the ability to, um, to accurately uh, recognize targets by about threefold, even 20 minutes after having, um, having had this deep brain stimulation. Um, there are other studies where uh, they've been using a brain computer interface as a trigger guard to to prevent friendly fire or civilian deaths through mistake. So there's one study um, that's in the, um, was the UK, the US and Australia um, measuring a series of brain waves, um, alpha, beta, delta and gamma. Someone will probably correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just a lawyer, not a scientist. Um, that, that worked out that um, the decision to, um, to fire with a, for a soldier with a finger on the trigger, the decision to fire took between 400 and 450 uh, milliseconds um, to, to make that call between, between deciding to fire and the trigger being pulled. It took about 200 milliseconds, so half that time, to realize that they'd made a mistake. Um, and so the idea here is that you then use that ability to then automatically engage a trigger guard, a, a block the shot um, using BCI technology in order to prevent a friendly fire death. Now, they were doing it in relation to friendly fire death, but it would also work for civilian death. If you realize that you've made a mistake, that someone is not, in fact, a soldier pointing a weapon at you, but a civilian um, in, in some other way. So, so there are a couple of, um, of technologies there that can work to, to help with compliance with the principle of distinction. Um, the second principle is the principle of proportionality. So this principle isn't about directly targeting civilians or civilian objects, but it's about incidental loss of civilian life or damage to civilian property. It's what's known colloquially as collateral damage. Uh, so, so launching an attack which might be expected to cause incidental loss of civilian life, injury to civilians, damage to civilian objects, or a combination thereof 
which would be excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage anticipated is prohibited. So a couple of things to note there, it's all about what was expected and anticipated by the attacker. So it's an assessment ex ante before it happens. Um, and the second thing to note is that it has to be a concrete and direct military advantage. So not speculative or hypothetical advantages being used to justify attacks. So again, the principle itself is not likely to be affected directly by BCIs because you're applying it to your own forces. But where you are using it to further launch attacks, it might become problematic. So if you are using BCIs, for example, to conduct image triage, you know, going through images searching for threats, that's one thing. It can be good if it's allowing you to sift information faster and more accurately, remember. But if you start to mediate the information flow to the soldier to try and stop information overload, for example, and in particular, if you start to remove contextual information from the operator or you're trying to focus them too narrowly, their ability to make the calculations that they need to make under this principle is going to be impacted. And it might end up resulting in violations of the law where you didn't intend that to be the case. And it's the same kind of thing with the requirement to take precautions in attack. So the law requires party to an armed conflict and uh, particularly those who plan on um, and decide on attacks to take certain precautions, to take constant care to spare civilians and civilian objects, to verify that a target is in fact a military objective, for example, uh, to take all feasible measures to ensure that the proportionality principle that I just talked about will not be um, will not be breached, and to cancel attacks where it's realized that there is a mistake or a miscalculation. Now, all of these requirements and all of these precautions require states to take measures that are feasible. So that means possible or practicable. And there are some BCIs in development that will actually help states and their personnel with that job. Um, so, for example, that, that joint US, UK and Australian project that I was mentioning with the trigger guard um, would, be, would be one of those. Um, and as I said, the, the idea is that the, there is enough time left over to disable the firing mechanism and block the shot, um, saving the life of the intended, intended party. Um, as far as I'm aware, that has not been operationalized yet. Um, but the particular whatever the particular technology is that um, that is involved will have to be scrutinized very carefully. But as the science develops, we're pushing um, we're pushing at the boundaries of what is possible, what is practicable, uh, and therefore, of course, what is feasible. So I should point out here that there is not usually a requirement on states to acquire technology, but if you have the technology, there is a requirement that you field it. Um, in order to meet these challenges. So, um, so the final principle that I want to talk about today is the, is the prohibition against causing a superfluous injury and unnecessary suffering. And you see the law written up there on the screen. It's prohibited to employ weapons, projectiles, material and methods of warfare of a nature to cause superfluous injury and unnecessary suffering. So Ryan is going to talk about weapons reviews for which this forms a fundamental part. So I'm not going to go into too much detail on whether or how the BCI is a weapon and what that means for this principle. But I do want to raise um, one, um, one other aspect of it, and that is that the principle will also come into play when you're trying to counter an enemy who is using BCIs. So for example, you would need to um, you would need to consider your options very carefully before deciding, <coughs> excuse me, that the best way to disrupt a swarm of drones um, that's being flown via BCI links is to target the operators with an EMP um, to short out their implanted neural chips, if that's going to result in permanent brain damage, just to, to give a, a sort of futuristic example of, of where you might want to go with that. So that's a brief overview of the principles of IHL and how they might be impacted by the development and use of BCIs. There are other principles here that might be in play, such as the principle of protection, um, which might come into play in detention issues. 
they're less relevant for BCI technologies than they are for other enhancement techniques that are being um, investigated by the military. Um, and there are other bodies of law, of course, that are also going to be relevant in this. And I know that Ryan is, is going to be talking about human rights law, um, which is which is a really important one when it comes to brain machine uh, interfaces or BC, BCI's brain computer interfaces, um, because, of course, they also apply during uh, during armed conflicts. So I'm going to leave it there um, and then um, say thank you and leave space for questions. But I think we take are we taking those at the end, Leona? That's that's right. Thank you so much, Heather. That was really really fascinating. I, I'll just uh, I'll just hand it over to Ryan now, so we can uh, we can continue with the presentations, and then we'll have um, a proper discussion at the end. So Ryan, you have the floor. All right. Um, hello, everyone, and and first of all, um, thanks very much to Yona and to Unidea for um, organizing the series of webinars. I think it's a, it's a very timely discussion and, and, and I particularly like the fact that, that it has been structured so as to give an overview of the, of the technology, the applications of the technology and then the broader um, uh, legal and, and ethical implications that we're looking at um, today. Um, so my plan is to do um, a couple of things. I will make a, sort of three preliminary points about law and technology more broadly perhaps um, and then raise sort of three sets of issues in relation to uh, BCI in particular and some of it I think is going to nicely echo what what Heather has already uh, uh, explained and some of it is going to to link to um, her presentation. So the first preliminary point that I want to make and this tends to come up in the context of, of emerging technologies, um, is the idea that if there's no specific legal rules to deal with a particular technology, in this case, a BCI, um, we have a legal vacuum, it's a wild west, everyone can do um, as they please. Um, and often that is connected to the idea that, well, if the technology that is being developed and applied is so brand new and law is almost by definition old, how can that old, old law uh, sort of govern something that is uh, that is brand spanking new. Um, and, and a good sort of lawyer's response is that if there's no specific rules, we apply more general uh, legal rules and principles. Uh, so if we don't have specific rules for BCIs, we consider what other rules and principles there are in the legal system, um, uh, whether that be international law or domestic law um, that are relevant. But admittedly, that can cause some difficulties. Um, there can be challenges in terms of interpreting and then applying um, the existing law, and, and Heather has identified some of the uh, interpretational and application issues, uh, and I will mention uh, a few more. The other preliminary point is that if there's no sort of tailor-made set of rules for BCIs or BCIs in a military uh, context, then we are sort of stuck with a kind of a normative patchwork. There's a set of the different sets of rules. Um, international lawyers and lawyers generally like to refer to them as as frameworks, but it actually, in the context of new technologies, uh, often looks more like a uh, somewhat haphazard patchwork. Um, and the, 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 the sets of rules and principles we need to consider here are you know, international law on the one hand and international humanitarian law or the law of armed conflict uh, in particular, um, arms control law um, and, and human rights law. But there are also other sources of rules and principles. So we shouldn't forget domestic law. Uh, militaries who propose to use new technologies, including PCIs, uh, have their domestic legal uh, frameworks to comply with. There might be defense policy and military doctrine um, that governs the use of technology and the integration of technology into uh, military operations. Um, there might be technical standards that pertain to um, various uh, equipment uh, used in the defense context and indeed health standards when it comes to an integration of the technology um, with a human being. And finally, uh, I think medical professional ethics plays a particularly significant role here. So if we're dealing with integration of technology uh, with a human being, um, that will often rely on the assistance of medical professionals. 
Um, and if anyone has had a conversation with military medical professionals, you will quickly realize that they are medical professionals first and uh, military personnel second. So they, they take their uh, sort of ethical um, uh, duties towards members of the armed forces as their potential patients uh, very seriously. So military medical ethics can also moderate some of the con concerns that can arise from the use of um, biotechnologies such as um, BCI. And the third point that I would make is that it's very difficult to provide an overarching legal assessment of um, uh, BCIs in the military context or in any other context for that matter. Um, so Heather provided some examples of particular issues that arise for particular types of BCIs, and I just really want to um, emphasize that. Because BCIs come in sort of different shapes and sizes as the uh, different as, as the presentations in the two uh, previous uh, webinars have very clearly demonstrated. So they range from um, uh, passive uh, BCIs, so which basically collect data from the brain but don't really do much else um, with it. So it can be used for monitoring um, the, the health of the um, uh, warfighter. Um, and there will be data protection issues, for example, that in particular arise in those circumstances. Um, the BCIs can be reactive, and the example of um, uh, BCI-assisted analysis of intelligence and imagery uh, has been mentioned as an example a couple of times, um, where the question is, to what extent can that uh, uh, BCI-assisted analysis be immediately re relied upon in the conduct of military operations, and to what extent it needs to be uh, vetted further by a, uh, a, 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 an operator who actually consciously um, uh, reconsiders and interprets the data. And finally, uh, things get more complicated when we deal with um, so active BCIs, so BCIs that are intended for controlling devices uh, in the military context that could be a platform, such as an aircraft, um, or a particular um, a weapon system. Um, and then there arise questions in terms of um, how does the integration of the person um, with the platform or a weapon system uh, allow for compliance um, with international humanitarian law. Some of these issues um, Heather has already raised. And then also, and particularly from a human rights uh, perspective, there's a pretty significant difference between um, invasive and non-invasive BCIs. Um, invasive BCIs, so implants into the human brain, obviously raise uh, more significant um, uh, legal as well as ethical concerns. Okay, so let me now sort of raise some of those um, legal uh, issues. And the first one, um, which is what um, Heather already highlighted, and it's the question around uh, BCIs being weapons, means, or methods of warfare. And indeed, some arguments have been made that enhanced human beings can become weapons for the purposes of international humanitarian law, but that argument can probably be um, uh, dismissed uh, reasonably quickly. Uh, but the question as to whether uh, BCI uh, enhanced human beings or the BCIs themselves are means or methods of warfare, I think, is a question that requires uh, more serious consideration. And why is that? Well, first of all, um, if we are talking about means or methods of warfare, they potentially become subject to uh, sort of specific controls that are developed through um, arms control treaties. Um, the chances of a BCI falling within the scope of an arms control treaty is probably um, fairly slim, but it needs to be kept in mind. Um, but more importantly, um, a means or method of warfare is subject to certain restrictions uh, under international humanitarian law. So there are general prohibitions of weapons, means, and methods of warfare that are inherently indiscriminate, um, cause superfluous injury, uh, or could, could cause um, excessive environmental um, harm. So if we say that a BCI or a, or a BCI enhanced human being is a means or method of warfare, um, then we need to consider whether the person or BCI complies uh, with these rules of, of international humanitarian law. And how that is done or how it's supposed to be done is through a legal review um, or a weapons review, um, which is something that is required under Article 36 of Additional Protocol 1 of states that are party to that particular uh, protocol. 
And that is basically a, a national process whereby any new weapon means or method of warfare is uh, essentially checked for compliance with the applicable um, rules of international law that are binding upon that particular um, state. Now, what are the challenges then in this context? Well, first of all, international law does not define weapons, means or methods of warfare. So it's very much up to the individual states to figure out to what extent BCIs might uh, meet one of those um, definitions um, or, or provide definitions and then check whether a particular BCI fa falls um, within the scope of one. Uh, and here again, national law and policy plays quite a significant role. But as a general proposition, it, it could be said that uh, a BCI that is used to control a, weapons, a, a weapon um, forms part of a weapon system and hence becomes a means of warfare for international humanitarian law purposes, or indeed the use of the BCI systematically to control a particular weapon amounts to a method of warfare. So there is a good chance that the use of a BCI in the context of a weaponized system gives rise to a legal review um, obligation. The particular practical problem that arises there is that generally uh, the, the legal review uh, processes assume that uh, a particular weapon uh, behaves in a similar fashion in the hands of a particular operator. In other words, the operators are interchangeable for the purposes of reviewing um, the weapon. But as one of the previous presentations in this series has indicated, that might not be the case with, with BCI. There was a point made that um, 20 to 25 percent of people are actually unable to learn to use uh, a BCI properly. So the question then becomes how do how does one or how does a state assess the lawfulness of a BCI knowing that not every person is capable of using the BCI uh, appropriately? So that raises questions about the methodology of weapons reviews, whether in fact, there needs to be a sort of a representative sample of users of BCIs taken from the military population, and then the assessment conducted on that sample population rather than just one single BCI device. So in other words, the use of BCIs may uh, uh, require states to think what their definitions of weapons, means, and methods of warfare cover and what the methodology for conducting um, uh, reviews are uh, in circumstances where the particular weapon means or method in its lawfulness might very much depend on the particular um, operator. The second set of uh, substantive issues that I wanted to mention was uh, to do with human rights law. And I particularly wanted to sort of focus on the involuntary use of invasive BCIs which would raise the most significant concerns under international um, human rights law. So international human rights law protects the bodily integrity um, of a human being, and it protects a member of the armed forces, a warfighter, even against their own government, even, over, even against their own uh, armed forces. So the armed forces need to respect the bodily integrity um, uh, of their members. And this is done in two ways under uh, human rights uh, treaty instruments. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights protects the right to privacy and bodily integrity sort of falls within the, the scope of protection um, of that right. However, that right is subject to limitations, including in the interests of national security. So if there's a um, legal basis, if there's a, uh, a legitimate aim such as national security, and if the measure is proportionate, the right to privacy and thereby also the right to bodily integrity um, can be restricted. But the uh, practice of treaty bodies, um, European Court of Human Rights, the UN Human Rights Committee, suggests that such restrictions or limitations to bodily integrity are generally tolerable in the context of ordinary medical treatment or prevention of disease. So routine vaccinations, um, standard medical procedures that benefit the, the person. Not necessarily in context where there's uh, enhancing capabilities or experimental um, uh, systems being used. 
So then we actually come to the protection of bodily integrity through the prohibition of torture and cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment under ICCPR Article 7. Unlike the right to privacy, this is an absolute prohibition that cannot be restricted in the interest of national security. And it's a provision that expressly applies to medical experimentation. So my conclusion, at least based on this, is that it would be very difficult to use invasive BCIs on an involuntary basis, basically forcing members of the armed forces to have them um, consistently with human rights requirements. Um, the ICCPR Article 7 seems to be applicable um, and seems to prohibit um, sort of the involuntary use um, of BCI, invasive BCI technology. And finally, the third substantive point I'm just going to raise because I don't really have very good answers to that myself. Um, and that is um, a question of whether BCIs become subject to defense export control regimes. So these are inter international regimes that are designed to prevent um, the proliferation of particular types of military technology and also dual use goods. And states have domestic procedures for uh, limiting the, ex the export of certain uh, military um, uh, devices. What then of a person who has an implanted BCI that has a military use? Do they, in order to travel internationally, need to require a defense export license? Or does the device need to be removed before they can go to their holiday to uh, Bali or, or, or wherever it is they may want to go? So I'll just raise that uh, issue, but, but sort of uh, leave it at that, but happy to have a, a discussion around it. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. That was that was really brilliant. Thank you so much. And I think, um, especially some of the things you you raised in the in the um, latter part of your presentation, will be a good sort of bridge to the to the final one, where I'll uh, hand it over to Marcello to cover some of the overarching ethical issues that are um, that arise in the context of, of use of um, of interfaces. So um, I'll just hand it over now because we are. Um, a bit pressed with time, and then we can have a conversation at the end with everyone. So much you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, um, Joanna. Um, I hope you can hear me fine. And uh, I also want to express my gratitude for this invitation. It's uh, a pleasure and honor to participate in this webinar uh, series. I'm aware we are running um, uh, out of time, so I'll try to be as concise as I can. Uh, but so, yeah, my task here is to uh, try to bring this uh, uh, very elegantly outlined conversation um, of the ethical of the legal implications of BCIs that Heather and Ryan uh, uh, Rain have outlined um, to a higher level of abstraction um, and bring in the uh, level of analysis uh, uh, of applied ethics and in particular of that subfield of applied ethics that is concerned with the ethics of neuroscience and neurotechnology, uh, namely neuroethics. So. Um, I will skip the part about the capabilities of neurotechnology because I'm assuming that the audience is already familiar with that. But so the main things that BCIs can do, and I think this is important because uh, when we talk about BCI, we tend to, uh, what one uh, misguided interpretation may be that we're talking about a very uniform uh, a technological application, but actually a BCI is, is any neuroinformatic system that can establish a channel of communication between the human brain and a, an external computer device. And this channel of communication uh, can be used for many different purposes, including reading out information from the brain, but also writing into the brain through neuromodulation and neurostimulation, or connecting brains and computers for purposes such as motor control. So we have to be mindful that these applications are quite heterogeneous, and so are the military applications of these technologies. And also one point I wanted to hotline um, very briefly is that uh, in 2023, BCIs are no longer a field of technological development that is entirely restricted to the clinical and biomedical research domain, uh, but it's a growing field of technological innovation in the industry sector, including through commercial applications of uh, personal uh, technology. And there is a quite broad ecosystem of brain computer interfaces for the general audience. Uh, so non-invasive BCIs that can be used by the general 
uh, public as a form of what we can call personal neurotechnology by analogy to personal computers, which was you know, the, the historical transition through which computers moved away from being a solely uh, research, um, uh, higher, research uh, technology or research-based technology or military-based technology and moved into uh, the domain of general use by uh, the general public. Now, one key uh, notion in applied ethics uh, when it comes to military uses of a technology is the notion of dual use. Uh, and particularly in the ethics of bio and neurotechnology, the dual use problem refers primarily to two things. So one is the co-optation of a civilian technology for military purposes. And the second one is the possibility of utilizing the same technology for both beneficial, such as, for example, clinical uses, um, and harmful misuse, for example, bioterrorism. Now, this is a very old uh, ethical quandary that applies not only to neurotechnology, but to, but to virtually any technology. Um, but a lot of research has highlighted in recent years that neurotechnology is a core domain of dual use technology, not just because many neurotechnology applications can be co-opted for military aims or are being military uh, co-opted for military aims, but also because uh, from a historical perspective, uh, newer technology was military oriented all along. Uh, the early uh, funding schemes for the development of uh, the first brain computer interfaces ba back in the 1970s uh, was mostly coming from uh, national security organizations and uh, defense agencies. Um, today we have three primary uses of BCIs for um, in the military setting. One is device control, uh, for example, for the uh, for remotely controlling uh, drones and other vehicles uh, using brain activity. Um, second is for the purpose of deception, detection, and interrogation. Uh, and the third one is uh, intercept-free communication. Um, so these are the primary domains. And to these three domains, we uh, can add cognitive enhancement, uh, but with the big caveat that we currently do not have a safe and effective cognitive enhancement brain computer interfaces that are being used uh, for military purposes. Um, in a paper written with two colleagues of mine, Fabrice Jodoran from Wisconsin and Bernice Elger from Basel, Switzerland, we address the problem of dual use in the context of neurotechnology. And we observed that um, neurotechnology is one of the few domains of technological innovation where the dual use problem has a bi-directional character, not a one-directional character. So we don't simply have the simple dynamic from civilian applications to uh, military uses, but we also have this uh, frequent spillover of uh, military uh, prototypes into the civilian uh, into the civilian sector. So through clinical or commercial applications, and this implies that any uh, strict restriction on military research on BCIs and other neurotechnology may also result in slowing down or even significantly limiting the development of uh, brain computer interfaces and other neurotechnologies for civilian purposes. Now, I want to conclude with a few uh, high level um, ethical considerations. Um, the first one is that Although we can rely to a large extent with uh, applied ethics paradigms coming from other fields of the life sciences, such as the general bioethics paradigms, there are some specific aspects uh, of ethical salience when it comes to the brain. Um, I don't intend to say that to commit to a, a radical ra neuroexceptionalist exceptionalist uh, ethical framework, uh, but I think we can quite um, uh, uncontroversially uh, highlight that the brain is not an organ like any other, but the fundamental processing unit of life maintaining processes, uh, and most importantly of mental faculties, such as consciousness, memories, uh, emotions, and many other things that in our intuitive understanding of personal identity, um, we, we tend to associate with what it means to be a human. 
Um, and so uh, there are four key ethical challenges that arise in this domain. The first one is the potential for enhanced predictive and inferential decoding of mental states from brain recordings, which raises the issues of privacy that Ryan has uh, as previously outlined. The potential for targeted and off-targeted influence of mental states through uh, neuromodulation and neurostimulation devices. Um, the potential for blurring the lines between the physical, biological, and the cyber digital world, uh, precisely because of the very definition of BCI, which is a, a system that uh, establish, establishes a direct communication pathway between a biological organ, namely the brain, and a computer, a uh, digital computer. And last but not least, the potential for disruptive transformation of fundamental ethical legal precepts, such as personal identity, freedom of thought, and, and personal identity. Um, I also want to um, stress the fact that we do have frameworks in place um, uh, when it comes to biosecurity, uh, which is broadly defined as the system of procedures and measures designed to protect the population against harmful biological, biochemical, or biotechnological products. Um, so uh, we can identify within biosecurity a narrower framework, which is specifically concerned with a subset, which is specifically concerned with the biosecurity implications of uh, neurotechnologies uh, and neurochemicals. Now, uh, Rain has uh, uh, also addressed the problem of uh, the, the, the legal implications of neurotechnology from the perspective of international human rights law. And um, I, I wanted to stress here that um, uh, the human rights implications of neurotechnology uh, have been framed under uh, a so-called uh, neuro rights framework. Um, so neuro rights um, have been defined uh, as the fundamental ethical, legal, social, or natural principles of freedom and entitlements related to a person's brain and mental domain. Uh, and uh, claims have been made that certain military uses of neurotechnologies could represent violations of neural rights. Uh, I also want to stress uh, and I think it's an important point, the new rights are not intended to be understood or conceptualized as something other from uh, or other than uh, human rights, but simply as a subset of human rights concern with the protection of the brain and mind, similarly to how genetic rights have been codified uh, as that specific set of human rights that is concerned with the uh, uh, protection of, genetic, of the genetic makeup of the human being. Um, <clears throat> and um, several organizations, intergovernmental organizations, are working on the uh, promotion of new rights, either as uh, brand new uh, rights to be added to the international human rights framework, or more plausibly, as evolu evolutionary interpretations of the rights that we do have, uh, but with... Uh, uh, by providing the, the uh, necessary specifications for their obligations to uh, the cerebral and, uh, and, and mental domain. Uh, and among those, uh, the UN Human Rights Council has approved uh, last autumn uh, a motion resolution on neurotechnology and human rights, and uh, uh, work is undergoing on uh, better understanding this human rights implications of neurotech. Um, I will conclude with uh, a very brief outline of uh, what uh, neural rights candidates are and how they look like. Uh, and the primary <clears throat> um, neural rights candidates that have been uh, proposed uh, so far are cognitive liberty, mental privacy, mental integrity, and psychological continuity. Uh, again, these principles should not be understood and as uh, brand new rights, uh, but they can also uh, be understood as uh, evolutionary interpretations of existing rights. So for example, cognitive liberty as a very uh, strong 
um, a logical and normative link to the principle of freedom of thought. Um, and it's defined as a person's mental self-determination, that is the freedom to record, modulate, enhance uh, their cognitive processes or refuse to do so. So it, it is in the philosophical sense, both a positive and a negative right. It's a, a positive right in the sense of a freedom to and uh, a negative rights in the sense of freedom from uh, external interference. Um, and a possible violation of this right may be constituted by uh, mandatory or coercive uses of neurotechnology, uh, such as uh, brain monitoring, so forceful brain monitoring on the workplace, uh, which is something that is being widely reported worldwide, especially in conjunction with high responsibility jobs, such as um, conductors of high speed trains in China or uh, people operating in nuclear plants. Uh, but this principle is also challenged by uh, the increasing embedded of AI components in the brain computer interface cycle through the so called uh, neuroadaptive uh, closed loop brain computer interfaces, where you basically have AI algorithms that uh, may make uh, automatic uh, classification and uh, uh, feature extraction decisions. Uh, mental privacy can be defined as a person's freedom and ability to seclude their mental information and prevent unconsented intrusion by third parties into a person's neurocognitive domain. And again, this is a problem that will be increasingly um, widespread as neurotechnologies proliferate uh, in unsupervised settings, uh, for example, through commercial uh, and uh, uh, personalized technology applications. Uh, there are already several reports of uh, uh, what we can call cognitive surveillance, namely the monitoring of uh, brain uh, processes such as attention and concentration in settings such as uh, uh, the school setting. So this is a, a pilot study uh, conducted at a, a elementary school uh, in, in China uh, by a US-based company named um, BrainCo with the aim of monitoring concentration uh, in uh, elementary school pupils. And I should also highlight that many of these applications have turned out to be uh, operating uh, through unprotected data sharing channels uh, that often uh, enable uh, the um, drawing of privacy sensitive conclusions, even from de identified and anonymized data. And this is happening in the absence of institutional supervision through ethics committees or professional supervision by a clinician. Uh, and uh, this is also happening with limited traceability and ver verifiability of the inferences based on the neural data for both the problem of black box AI algorithms used to do the processing, uh, but also because of uh, uh, intellectual property restrictions on most consumer PCIs. Uh, third, uh, second last is the principle of mental integrity, uh, which is already um, uh, mentioned in the International Human Rights Framework. Uh, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights um, mentions mental integrity uh, under Article 3. Um, and an evolutionary interpretation of this right um, has been proposed to uh, also prohibit, it, prohibit the unconsented and harmful manipulation of a person's neural activity uh, through a process that uh, Pim Haselager and I have called malicious brain hacking, uh, which is basically uh, the malicious hacking of brain computer interfaces for the dual purpose of either extracting information from uh, the BCI or uh, sabotaging or um, um, hijacking certain uh, settings of the BCI in order to um, modify its functioning. And uh, the last uh, principle I wanted to discuss today is the principle of psychological continuity, uh, which has been defined as the right to preserve one's own personal identity and the continuity of the self from unconsented external alterations by third parties. Uh, here, we do not have uh, real world uh, evidence of um, modifying a person's sense of self and, and personal identity um, in uh, an intended manner, uh, but we do have reports of uh, clinical cases where patients have experienced personality change uh, changes after undergoing uh, invasive uh, neurostimulation uh, as a form of so-called off-target effect, meaning not intended 
uh, by the clinicians, uh, but they just uh, happen as a sort of uh, uh, side effects of the neurostimulation. Okay, um, I, I, these slides are just to highlight that many other uh, intergovernmental organizations are working in this domain, including the Council of Europe and UNESCO. Uh, and that, uh, as Rain has already highlighted, many of these uh, neural rights candidate or putative neural rights uh, have a strong anchoring, so are not occurring in a vacuum, but have a strong anchoring uh, to international human rights law. So here are my conclusions. So the first one is the neurotechnology, um, or probably it's better to use the plural. So neurotechnologies are a technological family with a high risk of dual use. Um, many neurotechnologies are currently used or studied for purposes uh, of military nature uh, around the world. And while many neurotechnologies originally developed for civilian purposes have been co-opted for military aims, many military developed neurotechnologies have spilled over into the civilian, civilian sector through peaceful applications. So we experience a bi-directional dynamics. Therefore, uh, from my point of view, rather than a, a, an outright ban that is being proposed elsewhere, uh, an adaptive regulatory framework that maximizes technological progress in the civil sphere while minimizing the risks associated with the military cooptation of these technologies is preferable. This uh, framework um, should be based on uh, narrower specifications of biosecurity frameworks uh, through the so-called uh, neurosecurity framework uh, and may also be granted on the protection of new neuro rights uh, defined as the subset of human rights protecting the brain and mind. Current conceptual and practical work on neuro rights is ongoing at several intergovernmental organizations such as UN, UNESCO, Council of Europe, the OECD, and elsewhere. And while um, we do have uh, general rules uh, that are applicable in this domain, uh, there is a need for clearer and more specific guidelines that protect individuals against new technology misuse during both wartime and peacetime. And we also need an open reflection on whether new technologies such as BCIs and neurostimulation devices are currently covered uh, under the uh, BWC. And with this, I would like to um, thank my team and the funders and you for your attention. Thank you so much, Marcelo. You really uh, brought together a lot of teams. Uh, unfortunately, of course, uh, we have uh, just really a couple of minutes left. We will not have time to, to go into that much depth on each of these threads, but I want to go back just for the sake of uh, sort of wrapping up a few ideas on um, uh, on the law part. So I want to go back to YHL in a way uh, to, to to clarify some some points that were raised also by by Heather and Ryan. So um, which I think would be very important, also interesting for our audience to, to make it to make the topic a bit even more more real in a way and and and, and tangible. So, uh, Heather, when you when you discussed about the um, when you're talking about the, the the principle of superfluous injury and unnecessary suffering, so in in a situation such as um, that, that may arise when when uh, when we want to or when when we want to assess to to uh, to counter the um, a BCI. So, in order to assess that the the, the countermeasure on on such on, on a BCI is uh, is necessary, is legitimate, and therefore not superfluous, uh, in the context of the law, what kind of technical elements, what kind of technical specifications do we need to know about the interface in order to make the best assessment? So, in other words, what exactly do we need to understand about an interface in order to to make sure that we don't violate this principle? And I'll hand it to you first, and then I have a follow up question to Ryan on this? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, the the superfluous injury and unnecessary suffering, by definition, they're comparative terms, right? It's superfluous injury. It's unnecessary suffering. So it, it already is built into the law that some suffering is necessary um, to achieve your legitimate military advantage. Um, and it is a legitimate military advantage to want to disable a BCI interface that that's controlling a drone, for example, that's attacking your troops. Um, so, uh, so what you need to know is what is your countermeasure going to do in order to stop that happening, and is it necessary for it to do that? Is there another way that you can do it? So, so I mean, basically, you need to know 
one, what is the harm that you're going to cause by using your, by using your countermeasure? And two, what else do you have in your toolbox that you could use instead um, in order to achieve the same military outcome? Um, so, so those are kind of the things you need to know. And in order to do that, you need to know how that piece of technology is working. You know, what's the best way to achieve that particular aim with, with it causing sort of the, um, the, the least amount of suffering that you can do in order to achieve your legitimate military aim. So, and for, with this, actually, I, I, I'm going to hand it to Ryan because also he was talking about the legal reviews where, of course, we need to understand a lot about the, about a certain capability to understand, we need to understand very well the technology at stake. So in this case, um, in order to assess the amount of damage or the amount of harm that can be done by countering a, a BCI, it also implies that we need to have access to a certain kind of information on that BCI, on that kind of technological capability. So, Ryan, in, in the context of the law, would you say that this might create um, new obligations of disclosure? Or how how exactly does this fit into the conversation that, that we, we're having on, on the law? And so um, if you have any, any thoughts to share on, on this in a couple of seconds. I think it's up to the states to decide whether they want to create new obligations of disclosure. It's up to states to design their weapons review or legal review processes, and they can specify what information they require in order to complete that process. So it's really up to in the hands of states to provide the standards against which they assess the sort of the technical reliability of systems, for example and whether they rely on testing performed by the manufacturer of a particular device, whether they undertake their own testing, or whether they conduct third party um, testing. Uh, so I don't think there's any distinct obligation for additional <clears throat> disclosure, but states can certainly create one if they if they would like to, and it's probably a good idea. Okay, um, thank you. I, I know that we have more questions in the chat and also thank you, Ryan, for already taking some of those. And so that was really kind. Um, I think we, we are we are sort of um, ready to wrap up because we're running out of time, but I wanna ask a last question to all of you and perhaps I'll give you just a couple of seconds, 20 seconds each to, to respond uh, because we, we talked a lot about VCIs, and I think this is also an interesting way to sort of wrap up the entire series. We talked a lot about uh, opportunities and risks. So, of course, it's a it's a it's a capability that comes with a lot of risks, but there is also opportunities, obviously, that are that are harnessed by by this technology and with this technology, and the states can um, can benefit from including for making their their troops more uh, more uh, better fit to serve better fit to to conduct their military um, uh, military operations so can we potentially imagine scenarios where um, states may be expected or or even required for example through through positive obligation to provide soldiers with access to brain computer interfaces for example to to enhance certain cognitive functions or certain decision making skills uh, what are your views on this? And I think I'll take it, I'll give you the floor in the same order in which you, you had your presentation. So I, we can start with Heather, just a, a couple of parting thoughts on this. Yeah, I think what it, what it comes down to is, uh, from a legal perspective anyway, would be this obligation to take precautions in, in, um, in attack and defense. Um, and if, it, if, if the world of technology changes enough that this becomes sort of the standard that um, that this is what is required in order to be able to stop you from firing um, or, or to assess whether or not something is a legitimate threat fast enough, then you may find um, you may find a situation where states are now obligated because that's what's practical, that's what's feasible for states to do. There is, however, a big caveat on that um, and that there is a big difference between requiring a soldier to wear a BCI that is embedded in their helmet um, with with electrodes sitting on their scalp and requiring a soldier to have something implanted in their brain. Um, and there you've got massive human rights obligations, as Ryan, you know, very accurately set out. So so um, I'm going to give you a complete lawyer's answer. It depends. Um, it depends on the technology that you're talking about. Yes, absolutely. For externally worn BCIs, I can see a scenario where that would happen. For internally implanted ones, I think you've got a the world would literally have to be ending, I think, to, to get there, in my opinion. Thank you. Ryan, do you want to follow up on that? 
Sure, I agree with everything that Heather said. And I'd say that there's sort of two dimensions to this. One is the, the precautionary measures piece. Uh, and I mean, that raises the, the question that you know, if a, a state has in an armed conflict, uh, different means and methods of warfare available to it, then the question is to what extent must it choose the one that reduces as much as possible um, collateral harm. Uh, and this brings us back to the debate that has been going on for years about under what circumstances are states under an obligation to use precision guided munitions and so on and so forth. So I think it's a, it's a similar set of questions. Uh, and then there's the human rights dimension. Um, states do have the obligation towards um, members of the armed forces to respect their right to life. Uh, and while courts have generally been reluctant to question the sort of the big defense procurement questions, whether we buy tanks or whether we buy submarines, uh, and courts are also reluctant to question sort of in the field operational decisions, um, courts have dealt with the question of, you know, is there an obligation to provide um, soldiers with certain piece of kit that is available to that state as a matter of human rights law? Interesting. Marcello, do you want to pick up on that and uh, provide some concluding remarks? Yeah, I think I, I can try to answer um, that question from an ethical perspective. Uh, and probably I think the short answer would be um, yes, possibly under three big caveats. Um, uh, the first one being that uh, if you interpret this positive obligation as a moral obligation, uh, I, I think uh, it, it can be possibly argued that the, the, there is such a moral obligation, but this moral obligation is subordinated to uh, another uh, more important moral obligation, which is that of assisting uh, war fighters uh, that need BTIs for restorative purposes. Um, so uh, the, this uh, uh, positive obligation is subordinated to um, so using BCI for neuro enhancement purposes um, seem to me to be subordinated from a moral perspective to the obligation of uh, using BCI for restoring function, for example, in, in combatants with PTSD uh, who uh, may need in the future brain computer interfaces for selective uh, um, memory manipulation, uh, which is a kind of uh, BCI prototype that is currently being uh, tested in animal models. Um, the second caveat is uh, that not all neuro enhancement or not all enhancements are equal. Um, so it's it's very important to clarify what kind of uh, neuro enhancement we're talking about. So if you're talking about improving executive function, so what we commonly define as cognitive enhancement, uh, this um, seems to be an, an application of BCI technology, for example, um, thinking about bimodal BCIs that incorporate, uh, for example, EEG with uh, tax or other form of electrical stimulation. Um, then uh, for Im improving memory function, this seems to be something that can be possibly construed as a moral obligation for uh, the warfighters of tomorrow. Uh, but I think uh, many people would disagree that uh, moral or effective enhancement, so modifying um, aspects of uh, a person's moral psychology or even uh, emotions. So for example, making war fighters more belligerent uh, um, uh, from a neural rights perspective, I would, uh, um, uh, I, I would claim that this is a kind of application that would violate some fundamental uh, rights and moral entitlements of the person. Um, and, and then the third uh, caveat is uh, equality of access. So if there is such a, a moral obligation, uh, then it, it needs to be um, ensured that there is a, a fair and equal access to the benefits of these technologies. Uh, which and that there is no coercive use. And I want to highlight that coercion doesn't necessarily mean um, you ought to use that, what we call in, in ethics um, uh, explicit coercion, but there is also risk of implicit coercion. So we're uh, a context in which not adhering to a certain standard uh, may cause a competitive disadvantage to um, everyone involved. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So I, I think because we really, uh, we really actually even went over time. Thank you very, very much to all the speakers and to um, our audience for raising some really fascinating questions. Unfortunately, we could not obviously uh, cover all of them today, but really thank you all very much. Uh, and for the rich discussions, I, I really, um, I'm, I, I, I took a lot of notes. This has been really fascinating. And I think we couldn't have asked for a better end to the series in a way because you really provided a lot of food for thought, 
and also shows that we are uh, we, we have so many open questions ahead of us in, in dealing with this technology and integrating it in, in the military and so on. So with this, uh, we'll wrap up. And um, I also invite you to listen to the series on YouTube later if you want. We will have all the, the three videos there. Thank you all very much once again and have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thank you.